Hello everybody and welcome to History Bite number 25, dated August the 29th, 2020. I'm Walter, your mobile historian and blue collar scholar. This History Bite is entitled, The French Revolution in the United States. The French Revolution, whether you may or may not know this, had a very lasting impact on the development of politics in the early years of the United States. When war broke out between Britain and France in 1793, as a direct result of the French Revolution, neither side wanted the other to gain an advantage with America's lucrative trade. So, both attacked neutral American ships headed for each other's ports. President George Washington, wanting nothing to do with this war, between Britain and France issued a proclamation of neutrality, making it very clear that the United States of America was supporting neither nor and wanted nothing to do with this war. All right, Given America's position as a very important trading partner of both, our desire to remain neutral was very difficult. The French Revolution was responsible in part for the creation of the first party system here in America in the 1790s. The Democratic Republican Party, a party essentially created by Thomas Jefferson, was very sympathetic to the French and their revolution, whereas the Federalist Party, a party largely created by Alexander Hamilton, all right, was very sympathetic to Britain. So we see America's first two major political parties in conflict over what country to support in a war. All right, the Federalists prefer England, the, the Democratic Republicans prefer France and the French Revolution. Okay, it is known obviously that President Washington, though officially neutral and not taking any side in this war, certainly leaned more toward the Federalists because I'm sure. Even Washington viewed the violent nature of the French Revolution as potentially dangerous to America. Jefferson's Republicans, in stark contrast to the Federalists, did want America to somewhat become involved in this war, reminding the Washington administration that technically the United States and France still had the 1778 Treaty of Alliance which would bind America to assist France in the event of war. Federalists counterattacked Jefferson's position, stating that uh, that treaty was made with King Louis XVI, as King Louis XVI has been executed, and therefore obviously is no longer in power, that treaty is now null and void and has no binding effect on the United States. Washington sided with the Federalist position, that coincided with his own desire to remain neutral. Needless to say, the French weren't pleased about that. Matter of fact, they were downright pissed off. Okay, and Their ambassador in the United States certainly reflected those sympathies. Uh, Edmond Genet, who was France's minister to America at this time, even went so far as going beyond all limits and arousing public opinion to support the French Genet hoped to get the American people to demand that Washington ask Congress to declare war against Britain and join France in this conflict against the British. Okay, Washington, needless to say, was furious, and I do mean furious, at Genet's actions, okay, and told him to stop immediately. But Genet was obstinate and refused. So eventually, Washington told France, in no uncertain terms, come get your boy, take him out, recall him back to France. We don't want him here anymore. He's causing too many problems. He is a dangerous foreigner, and he must go. All right? France, not wanting to worsen the relationship with America anymore, agreed and recalled Genet not long thereafter. Now Genet somehow 
developed and suddenly developed some humility at this point. And knowing that once he arrived back in France, he was likely to meet the guillotine, he begged Washington to grant him asylum in America. Washington eventually agreed, being the nice guy that he was, only, however, on the insistence of very anti-French and pro-British Federalist Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton. Okay, Hamilton persuaded Washington to allow Genet asylum in America, primarily because he did not feel Genet should have to go back and be subjected to such a murderous, barbaric regime in France. So Genet is out of the picture, but the damage is still done. All right. So while you know France and the U.S. are obviously, you know, slightly beefing at this point, all right, we're still also beefing with the British. And seeing as how British have the bigger navy, we felt it most prudent to make sure everything was straight with them first. So Washington dispatched John Jay to Great Britain, and the result was the Jay Treaty of 1795, which was actually quite a bit of a success for us. In the Jay Treaty, okay, Britain agreed to pay us restitution for our damaged shipping. Uh, both countries agreed to satisfy debts owed to the other. And Britain finally agreed to leave its forts in the Northwest Territory in the United States. Yes, for the record, as of the year 1795, 12 years after the Treaty of Paris was signed, where Britain recognized American independence, Britain still had troops on American soil. Yes, they were blatantly violating the Treaty of Paris. But under the Jay Treaty, they finally agreed to and did evacuate those forts. Okay? Now, the reaction to the Jay Treaty in America was very divided, like everything else. Federalists hailed the treaty you know, as very welcome, welcome bond and bridged with our British mother country. Whereas Jefferson's Republicans viewed it as a devil's pact, essentially that America was selling its soul to Britain and trading out its longtime ally, France. To the Federalists, the Jays Treaty was almost treasonous. Okay, treachery. We're throwing away the country that helped us win our independence from the British. And now we're riding the coattails of England. Boy, if there was anything which angered Americans more in the 1790s than the Jay Treaty, haha, <laughs> it's hard to debate what it would have been. All right. The Jay Treaty was not popular with a lot of segments of society, uh, but it was very popular with some and was ratified accordingly by the U.S. Senate. Okay. So, given these tensions, you know, the Jay Treaty temporarily left Britain on the side, you know, okay, the beef with them is temporarily abated and would be for the next 10 years. But now, we've really got beef with the French, okay, in the 1796 presidential election, you know, those beefs were highlighted, you know, as the Federalists attacked uh, Jeffersonian Republicans as, like I said, supporting this violent French Revolution, which they hope will come to America and destroy everything we've created. You know, and the Jeffersonian Republicans are attacking the Federalists, you know, as these pro-monarchist British who want to establish a monarchy here in the United States. Okay, so this election is mean, it's nasty, it's a rock fight. 1796 is, you know, basically, essentially about the French Revolution. This is our presidential election about what's going on in France, okay? Um, thankfully, uh, Federalist John Adams won the election, you know, my main man, John Adams, thankfully he won the election, and the Jeffersonian Republicans, who supported the violent French revolutionaries, were defeated. And then, But it was no pleasure cruise for Adams, because now the French were really, really, really beginning to attack our merchant shipping in the Caribbean and in other places, okay? So Adams' policy is the same as Washington. He wants to avoid war. All right, so he dispatches commissioners to France. Unfortunately, those commissioners are refused the ability to even talk with the French government. Okay, to even talk with the French government, the French demand a, a bribe of about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in additional money to show our good faith. It was known as the X Y Z affair. I'm not going to get into that because that could be a history bite unto itself. 
But, you know, just the mere fact that they did this basically shows the nadir of Franco-American relations. French won't even talk to us unless we pay them first. Okay, so you have to realize in the late 1790s, folks, the U.S. and France were this close to war. This close. Okay, I mean, we were this close to war with the French. Had it not been for the insistence of President Adams to avert war with France, okay, to avoid a war with the French, okay, averting war at all costs, okay, we may well have gone to war with the French. Uh, thankfully, in November 1799, the last vestiges of the French Revolution came to an end when Napoleon seized power, okay, and an executive council would rule France. Napoleon was interested in regaining America as an ally, and as a result, a treaty between America and France was signed in November of 1800, at long last bringing an end to the quasi-war between France and America. Okay, The issues, though, would spill over into the 1800 presidential election. But the bottom line is here, United States and France, at this almost the entire lower half of the 1790s were all were practical for all intents and purposes in an undeclared war with each other, uh, known as the Quasi War, a naval conflict. Okay, it was never officially a declared war, and President Adams was determined and did successfully keep us out of an officially declared war. All right, the treaty brought an end to the conflict between the U.S. and France. All right. Napoleon described the issues with the U.S. as little more than a family quarrel, although family quarrels can get real sometimes, so I'm not sure if that was the best way to describe it. But no matter, the conflict with France was over, and it issued in a whole new era of Franco-American relations. All right, so that brings that to a conclusion, and then, of course, Thomas Jefferson won the election of 1800, and Napoleon's in power in France at this point. And of course, we know later on, a few years later, we see the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, once France retook control of the Louisiana Territory, Jefferson didn't trust Napoleon and felt that America needed to acquire that territory, lest Napoleon may turn his hand on America itself. So, but in conclusion, I would like to say that at no point did the United States ever give endorsement or support to the violence and the bloodshed of the French Revolution. We viewed the French Revolution as wholeheartedly different than our own. Nothing good was to come of the French Revolution, in our opinion. The only thing that would come of the French Revolution was death and destruction. And for all intents and purposes, if you were looking at the French Revolution from another country, it would be hard to dispute that point. All right? So, because of America's refusal to... Uh, support that revolution, relations between the U.S. and France soured, okay, and basically led to armed conflict on the oceans, all right. Thankfully, that family quarrel that Napoleon uh, so pleasantly mentioned came to an end after only about four or five years, but for that time, it was real. And thankfully, since that time, the U.S. and France have never again engaged in conflict against one another. So, I thank you very much for listening to this history bite about the French Revolution and the United States. Okay? And I hope you learned something. You learned enough to share it with others. And, as with everything, I hope you enjoyed it. Alright? Take care, and I will talk to you at the next history bite. Have a good one.